Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. My name is Stephanie Fassler and I'm the International Affairs Program Director for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to this evening's Author Series and World Affairs Today program. In tonight's event, we look at Cold War Washington, D.C. The United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a seemingly endless dance of political, military, and diplomatic maneuvers. During this time period, it was in the stone and brick houses and mansions of Georgetown that intellectuals, academics, societal elites, journalists, politicians, and diplomats gathered at cocktail and dinner parties. They discussed the events, policies, and politics of the day. In this way, this group of people, who came to be known as the Georgetown Set, influenced the course of U.S. Cold War policy. Greg Herkin, the author author of The Georgetown Set, Friends and Rivals in the Cold War Washington, takes a look at this unique group of individuals, evaluating their successes and failures. Dr. Herkin is an emeritus professor of history at the University of California and a founding faculty member of the School of Social Sci Sciences, Humanities, and the Arts at UC Merced. He previously served as chairman of the De Department of Space History at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum. He's the author of a number of books, including The Winning Weapon, The Atomic Bomb in the Cold War, Councils of War, and The Brotherhood of the Bomb, The Tangled Lives and Loyalties of Robert Oppenheimer, Ernest Lawrence, and Edward Teller. Please join me in welcoming Greg Herkin. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, but I thought I might begin by talking a bit about uh, how and why I wrote uh, the Georgetown set. I, uh, I retired from the University of California about four years ago, and I decided then that I wanted to write a history of the Cold War, which is something that I had taught at various schools for almost 40 years. But I didn't want to write a, uh, a policy history, a documentary history. I wanted to write a, a history about the people, the people who had some influence uh, in the Cold War. And really my, uh, my inspiration or the model was uh, the previous book uh, that I wrote about, published about a, a dozen years ago called Brotherhood of the Bomb. Uh, I wanted to write there about the, uh, the scientists who had built atomic weapons. And again, I wanted to write about the people. So I chose um, Edward Teller, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, and Ernest Lawrence. And in fact, the book was going to be a biography of Edward Teller initially, but Teller was too difficult a subject, so I decided I would write about Lawrence. And Lawrence is really most interesting if you put him in the context of his friendship with Robert Oppenheimer. So it, it really became a book more about Robert Oppenheimer than any of the others. But what I was interested in is the tension and rivalries between uh, this group. And uh, it's an approach that I've come to think of as uh, not group biography, but opposed biography. So the, the uh, Georgetown set were really the pundits, the uh, publishers, the diplomats, and, um, um, and others, and, uh, and actually the spies of uh, Cold War Washington. Here, is the, uh, here are the pundits. Uh, the Joe Alsop on the left and Stuart Alsop on the right were among the premier pundits, political pundits of the Cold War. They wrote a column called Matter of Fact that was published four times a week in, at their height, uh, over uh, 200 daily newspapers. They had a readership of about 25 million uh, altogether. And the publisher, uh, this is the publisher of uh, the Washington Post, Philip Graham. Uh, the Washington Post was one of the papers that, one of the 200 papers that published, matter of fact. Uh, Graham was described actually by uh, David Halberstam as an incandescent personality. Um, Joe Alsop said, this is a man in whose company it was impossible to be bored. Uh, but he was a, uh, a manic depressive individual as well, and he would uh, take his own life 
1963. And when he did, uh, the Washington Post empire was really inherited by his wife, by Catherine Graham. And the assumption that everybody had, and probably even Catherine Graham herself, is that she would liquidate the, uh, the empire. The, by that time, um, Phil Graham had bought Newsweek in, uh, in 1961. There, were, uh, there was at least one radio station and one TV station in, in addition to the Washington Post itself. And Kay Graham had been sort of a shrinking violet personality, certainly subordinate in, uh, to her more dominant uh, personality husband, to Phil Graham. So it was assumed that she would not, uh, she would probably liquidate the empire and that would be the end of it. That was even Stu Alsop's prediction. And she surprised everybody and probably even herself when she uh, became the managing, or actually the, the publisher of the Washington Post and the CEO of the Washington Post Company. And I think you probably all know that she would lead the Post on to greatness uh, to arguably uh, the same status uh, as the paper of record as the New York Times. Uh, with uh, coverage, the post coverage of um, the Pentagon Papers and also uh, Watergate. Well, a lesser known figure is the spy of the story. This is uh, Frank Gardner Wisner. Frank Gardner Wisner was actually head of an organization in the State Department uh, dating back to 1948. It was, in effect, the Department of Dirty Tricks. It was called the Office of Policy Coordination which was a term of art invented to fool the Russians. Uh, but it basically was a, the Department of Covert Operations. Uh, for, and, and in fact, the, the spirit and the guiding force behind the uh, covert operations really uh, was Frank Wisner. Uh, the coup in uh, Iran uh, in 1953, the coup in Guatemala in 1954, uh, were basically the handiwork in large part of Frank Wisner. Uh, once, actually by 1952, the Office of Policy Coordination had been folded into the CIA and he became the later the directorate, uh, the director of plans, the, uh, the plans directorate uh, in, uh, at the CIA. So he continued, and that was in 1958, he would continue in that role until 1961 and he, he had actually early on uh, in 1950 a program uh, called Project Fiend and Project Fiend was a project that was to parachute what he called ethnic agent teams into uh, communist countries, uh, and Albania in particular, with the intent that these teams, and these were uh, native Albanians, that they would, uh, anti-communist, that they would uh, foment revolution and eventually form a force within uh, the country that would overthrow the communist government of Enbar Hoxha. The, uh, Unfortunately, there's a lot, actually, there's a fair amount in the book about Project Bean. We now know that the project was penetrated from the beginning, that in fact everybody who was parachuted, uh, virtually everybody who was parachuted in was killed or captured in short order. And what I found fascinating really about, uh, about the whole, about Wisner and the whole project is that it kept on going, that it developed a life of its own, that even though uh, the re these people did not, who were parachuted in, did not report back, or the few survivors would report that uh, their comrades were uh, were captured or killed almost immediately. That uh, that Wisner and the CIA kept it up, and I think this partly is because they couldn't think of anything else I think to do, and they kept on hoping it would work. Well, we know now from KGB archives that uh, it was penetrated from the beginning. That the KGB passed along to Albanian uh, security service. Uh, not only the operational details, but even the names of the agents. And the agents, some of the agents who survived said that when they landed, uh, and they were almost immediately ambushed and, and that some in the ambushers, the secret uh, security force, uh, even knew their names. So it was an interest, so uh, Frank Wisner. Uh, and um, there are um, Others that are of but not in the Georgetown set that are in the book, and this is a group that I call the, the Russia Hands. These are the uh, people who were the uh, American experts on the Soviet Union, and the person here to the right of John Kennedy is Chip Bolin, who was American ambassador to Russia and one of the premier experts, in fact, on, uh, uh, on the Soviet Union. And in fact, this picture is historic, I found out, because this is on the very first day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in fact, it, uh, Chip Bolin was probably the first person outside of Kennedy's inner circle 
to learn about the Soviet missiles in Cuba. Uh, he was about to go off to Paris to become the American ambassador there, and Kennedy uh, briefed him. He was there actually for a breakfast meeting with Kennedy. Kennedy had just been told by uh, George Bundy, the national security advisor, about the missiles in Cuba. And uh, Kennedy was very much interested in Boland's opinion. He valued, he had, Kennedy said he had two great demonologists, two great experts on the Soviet Union. One was Chip Boland and the other was Llewellyn uh, Tommy Thompson, who is also a member of the Georgetown set and who we'll see in a, in a, in a minute here. Chip Boland just parenthetically said there, there are two great, uh, great lies in the English language. Uh, the first is champagne doesn't affect me and the second is I understand the Russians. So another Soviet expert, uh, uh, and this is George Kennan, who was the uh, originator of the containment thesis, which really guided American policy from President uh, Truman to Reagan. Um, and actually, George Kennan was not living in Georgetown, but he was a frequent guest at Joe Alsop's dinner table. Well, luckily for me, uh, in, in telling the story, all these people lived within a six to, uh, to eight block area in Georgetown. This is a map that I, I had made for the book, and it shows the proximity here of how, uh, of where everybody lived. And uh, there was something called the Sunday Night Supper. It was the classic Georgetown salon, where basically the, uh, the Wisners, the Alsops, the Grams, who were all friends and neighbors, who would sort of swap, uh, would go to each other's houses on Sunday, sort of a rotating dinner party. They would alternate uh, which house it would be. And there would be other guests there who would be senior diplomats in the, um, in the Foreign Service, foreign diplomats, um, uh, members of Congress, senators, congressmen, Chief Justice uh, Frankfurter, who was also a neighbor and friend of, of this group. Um, and it's even been said that actually that American foreign policy was made at the dinner table of Frank and Polly Wisner. I would say actually it was more likely made at the dinner table of Joe and Susan Mary Alsop, but I'll, I'll get to that. This is a, a picture, it looks like the Georgetown set at play, uh, actually, and here is Chip Boland on the left, Frank Wisner, and Boland, of course, again, this is uh, after he had been Soviet ambas American ambassador to the Soviet Union. Frank Wisner, uh, head of plans at CIA, who was actually coming back from London for this occasion. Tommy Thompson, uh, the other, in addition to Boland, the great demonologist. And um, Phil Graham, and that foot actually belongs to Joe Alsop, I know, because I have another picture that shows Joe in the, in the frame. Uh, but this picture was taken, actually, I could date it to June 1961, that uh, President Kennedy had asked uh, for this group, uh, the, ex the Soviet experts and, um, and Joe Alsop, who was going to write his column, matter of fact, and uh, Phil Graham to come out and to advise him on what he should do in confronting uh, Nikita Khrushchev over Berlin. This is at the height of the Berlin crisis of 1961. And Kennedy wanted to make sure that he had support. First off, he wanted the advice of Thompson and, and Bolvin but also he wanted to make sure that he had the support of uh, the most important newspaper publisher in the capital, Phil Graham, and one of the most important pundits in the capital, uh, Joe Alsop, uh, in any step that he would, any confrontation he would have uh, with Khrushchev uh, over, over Berlin. And this picture was actually taken at Glen Welby, which is the, um, was the, uh, the Graham's 300-acre uh, estate near Middleburg, Virginia. Um, Kennedy was at Glen Ora, which was nearby. That was his own family retreat, and, uh, and this group had gone over already to advise him. Well, here's an iconic picture of Joe Alsop at his uh, iconic Underwood uh, typewriter um, and horn, horn rim glasses and all. And here's a publicity shot from the Library of Congress of the two brothers that Stuart Alsop is referred to oftentimes as the... Um, kinder, gentler Alsop, and the more human version of his older brother. Uh, Joe was uh, very much character. Uh, Stuart, um, certainly a character, but uh, more moderate in his temper. And I think here, um, I don't probably need to tell this audience that this is Georgetown. <laughs> this is the iconic, one of the iconic pictures of Georgetown. Um, Joe Alsop said that, uh, that there was an element of, called Georgetown charm and that basically the, the houses were large enough for a couple with one child and a poodle, 
and uh, and that was about it. Uh, he decided to build a bigger house, but I'll get to that story in a in a little bit. And George and um, uh, Joe Alsop moved to Georgetown in 1935. He was a reporter in the Great Depression for this for the. Uh, New York Herald Tribune at that time. He was the Washington, well, there wasn't a bureau chief. In effect, he was it. Uh, and there was, and he had little competition in those days, actually, uh, among his fellow reporters. This is one of the houses where the parties, where the, uh, I should say, the salons took place. This is the Graham's house at R and 29th. And uh, Phil and, and um, uh, Catherine Graham bought this house in 1946. It had been previously occupied during the war by uh, Wild Bill Donovan, uh, who, was, who had been head of the Office of Strategic Services, America's wartime intelligence operation. Uh, and Donovan was fired, basically, by Truman in mid-September 1945. He was out of a job. He had hoped that, in fact, he would continue in his role, that the OSS would continue. But he moved back to his law practice in New York. And um, the, uh, the Grams, Phil Graham, had just been appointed by Eugene Meyer, uh, Catherine Graham is the op is um, the uh, mm, associate uh, publisher of the paper. In the next year, by 1946, he was the publisher of the paper. This is another uh, venue where the uh, the parties took place. This is the the house the Wisners had on uh, P Street, uh, Frank and Polly Wisner. That that the uh, the rumor or the legend is that the CIA actually underwrote the cost of the cocktail parties there because Frank used the venue to uh, trade information and obtain information uh, from his guests, who were many of, many of them foreign diplomats. It was said that the Mossad never passed up an opportunity. The Mossad, the Israeli intelligence uh, uh, unit that was stationed at the nearby embassy, never uh, passed up an opportunity to go to the uh, Wisner's house uh, but you could always tell uh, their agents because they didn't drink. <laughs> and this is uh, Joe Alsop's house, 2720 Dumbarton Avenue. And you can see uh, that it's quite a departure from the other houses, that Joe Alsop decided in 1949 uh, that he was tired of what he called Georgetown fakery. He was going to build his own design and have built his own house on a, uh, a more re on his somewhat lesser budget than than, than certainly the Grams had, and uh, and this was the result. Uh, he said it was. He, he wrote an article for the Saturday Evening Post called "I'm Guilty." I wrote a, I, I built a modern house, and uh, in it he said that he was tired of this bakery and and uh, that he was going to build this this uh, house that was a cool. Uh, private place, uh, but was a, a heinous outrage against Georgetown charm, and the neighbors basically agreed uh, that uh, you can't. This is not a color picture, but it's uh, it was made of cinder block. It had casement windows, and it was colored uh, yellow. What one townsperson, one Georgetowner, called a bilious yellow. Uh, Joe called it ochre, but uh, <laughs> this was the house and. Um, it, uh, it created quite a stir, as a matter, as a matter of fact, the Georgetown Citizens Association, um, Citizens Association of Georgetown lobbied Congress to pass the old Georgetown Act after this house was built. Uh, they actually got a law forbidding uh, future cinder block houses in Georgetown, so this is the only one there. It sold, by the way, uh, I think in 2008 to a real estate uh, mogul for about $4 million. So. This is a, a more current picture. Well, this was his favorite room. This is the garden room. Uh, this is where he would dress in his kimono and read the newspapers every day. This is where he would carry out interviews oftentimes with the people, the subjects, as you were, uh, of, his, uh, of his column. Um, I, I actually, I just noticed the other day that I can, I can actually date this photograph uh, to before 1961. And the reason is uh, Joe had a parrot, uh, it was either a parrot or a toucan, called Bill. And you can see Bill in the, uh, in the cage there. And in 1961, when Robert McNamara was appointed Secretary of Defense by President Kennedy, uh, McNamara was interviewed by Alsop, and uh, Joe, uh, Bill, the, the parrot, uh, spat a half-chewed banana out on top of uh, McNamara's bald spot, and uh, that was. But, <laughs> and shortly thereafter, uh, Joe got rid of uh, of Bill and replaced them with two morning doves here. Uh, 
but uh, Joe had no apologies for uh, for his house, and there, there was a, the house, uh, the garden room opened out, uh, but through French doors onto an interior courtyard uh, garden, and there was a logia there, and uh, the kind of attention to detail that Joe exhibited is that he consulted with the uh, astronomer at the Naval Observatory to find out the optimum sun angle for planting wisteria before he planted it. So he was certainly fastidious. This gives a somewhat false idea of the, uh, of the salons. This is a stage picture that, was, that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, that's, um, let's see if I, well, yeah, there we go. That's uh, Tish Alsop, uh, the wife of Stuart, who is here. That's uh, Jose, who was Joe's butler. That's uh, Joe with his back uh, to us here. And it, uh, in fact, the, the cocktail parties and the dinners were really quite raucous that he had on the, the so-called Sunday night suppers. In fact, Joe called them the Sunday night drunks because they were, uh, they started with strong martinis. They went to his signature dishes of leek pie and terrapin soup, um, the terrapin that is now part of an endangered species or a threatened species uh, and has disappeared from Georgetown tables as a result. This was where the action really took place. This was his dining room, and um, he could the uh, the table would extend uh, so that you could seat twelve people around it. Uh, this is where uh, Joe would hold forth, and where he would uh, uh, where the guests would find the experience, as they said, either terrifying or exhilarating, or sometimes both. Uh, and you can see that uh, the the various portraits on the wall. He wasn't related to uh, George Washington, but Joe was related to uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, the family had married into the uh, Oyster Bay Roosevelts. Uh, and Joe's grandmother, Corinne, was actually uh, T.R.'s uh, sister. One of the guests who was at the, uh, at the, the table said that, uh, advised another guest who, was, who had been invited uh, that he should talk as loudly as you possibly can and answer your own questions. And uh, another guest uh, talked uh, one evening about feeling uh, the small seawater cold eyes of Alsop ancestors gazing down at him throughout the dinner, and he found that rather freakish. Here's a classic uh, photograph. Joe would, would, of course, sit at the head of the table um, that he would, um, at a certain point, usually he would hold forth at great length in what he called the general conversation or the Gen Con. And at some point, he would, um, he would lower his glasses theatrically and uh, have a fix-it stare upon uh, his victim, upon whoever the, uh, the person was that he wanted to interrogate. And he would say, so what do you think of that? And uh, typically, before the, the victim could respond, uh, Joe would give his own opinion again. And he would hold on to his, uh, the conversation, or really the monologue, by a droning a hum, a hum, a hum that was kind of characteristic of, uh, of him. So, but, uh, but, another, but Boland called him an emotional hemophiliac, uh, and, his, and usually the evenings uh, ended with uh, his favorite toast, which was, here's to all of us. Uh, this is Susan Mary Alsop, who came onto the scene in 1961. Um, Teeny, who actually was at a, a, a Teeny Zimmerman, who was uh, Joe's niece uh, and who lives here in Washington and who actually attended a previous talk of mine at Politics and Prose. Um, Teeny said uh, to me that Susan Mary would be glamorous if you put her stark naked in the middle of the Gobi Desert, that she uh, was a, a former Vogue model. Uh, she lived in Paris, actually, with her husband, Bill Patton. Bill Patton was the, um, uh, the, the Harvard roommate of Joe Alsop. Uh, well, I'll get to, uh, and I'll get to Susan Mary. But Susan Mary would, uh, when she married Joe, became uh, the hostess of the Sunday night suppers. And uh, uh, together, they were quite a Washington power couple. Well, this is, uh, in fact, this shows uh, their, uh, their connectedness, that uh, this is a picture that I think was taken by Jackie, but I got from Susan Mary's son, uh, Bill Patton. Uh, and it's uh, Joe and, and President Kennedy. It was taken at the White House. This is, I think, the first, in fact, I know, the first private dinner uh, in the Kennedy White House. The guests were Joe and Susan Mary Alsop and Phil Graham and um, uh, Catherine Graham. And, in fact, Joe would talk about the... Uh, the bucket full of caviar, the milk bucket full of caviar, and the limitless uh, Dom Perignon at the, uh, the dinner. 
Uh, Bill Patton Jr., uh, who again was Susan Mary's son, uh, was really nice enough to uh, loan me Susan Mary's personal photo album. And some of the photos in the book are from that album. This is one of them. This is just to get a flavor of the Georgetown parties, if you will. This is, uh, that's her block, the uh, Washington Post columnist on the left. And these, these are the Ritters uh, of the Knight Ritter News Agency on the right. And I don't, this, I'm not sure which party this was. This had to have been, I think, in the late 60s. Uh, but, um, and I don't know what Joe Househuff had done to, to prompt that, but uh, it's typical of him, anyway. Who, who owned the Cezanne? Beg pardon? Who owned the Cezanne? Uh, I don't know whose house this was, but it could very well have been Averill Harriman's. In fact, it probably was. I think this was Harriman's 70th birthday party. Uh, and that's Catherine Graham, in a pose you don't normally see, uh, on the left, and uh, Tommy Thompson, uh, one of the other, you know, the demonologists on the right. Uh, Averill Harriman uh, on, on the left. And I think this, this had to have been a costume party. This, I think, was Harriman's, again, 70th birthday party. And uh, it was a costume party, and Joe apparently decided he would go as an anti-war demonstrator, or his vision of what one would look like anyway. And uh, on the right, McGeorge Bundy is going as the national security advisor of President Kennedy and, uh, and then later President Johnson. Well, I, I think one thing about uh, the journalism of the Alsops is that they were ahead of their time in many ways, that they anticipated, or they really broke uh, some major stories, and, and they anticipated, I think, what might become important. This was an article they together wrote in, 19, in January 1946 that was prophetic about the Soviet-American nuclear arms race. They were among the first journalists to warn, to warn about the, the danger of Soviet expansionism. Uh, and in fact, that became really a continual sort of drumbeat cause for Joe Alsop. But this was a prophetic article that really anticipated not only the Soviet-American nuclear arms race, but described in some detail the possible consequences of a nuclear war, including this was the first article to talk about the effects of fallout. And this is in 1946. Uh, Joe and Stewart had other causes that they promoted uh, together, actually, with Phil Graham in his newspaper. And this was a, a poster for um, the Marshall Plan. And Joe and Stewart were among the first journalists to advocate actively in their column, matter of fact, for the Marshall Plan, for the economic re American aid to, uh, to Europe for economic recovery purposes. And uh, again, their, art, their columns were published in the Washington Post. But in addition, uh, Phil Graham would write, personally himself, would write editorials for the Post that uh, promoted the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine and basically the policies of the Truman administration vis-a-vis re -vis Russia. The Alsops uh, were early critics of, of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. And in fact, they were very suspicious of Hoover. They, and at the end of the war, their concern was that Hoover, having uh, dominated domestic intelligence, would expand, now that uh, the OSS was gone, that would expand into foreign intelligence and dominate that. So the Alsops were early advocates of a civilian central intelligence agency that would be independent and separate from uh, Hoover and his empire and the FBI. So they were very happy in 1947 when the National Security Act was passed and the CIA was created. They were also among the first, uh, and this I think is not generally known, among the first to take on uh, Joseph McCarthy, that McCarthy's speech, famous speech at Wheeling, West Virginia uh, in February 1950, where he said there were 89 communists in the State Department or 251 or whatever the number was, it kept on changing, that um, that very soon after that, two weeks after that speech, uh, Stuart Alsop wrote a column that uh, basically warned that McCarthy and McCarthyism was going to be a, a fundamental danger to American liberties. So they were really among the first journalists to take on McCarthy well before uh, Edward R. Murrow, who was the subject of the, uh, the film um, Good Night and Good Luck, uh, and Murrow's program, his TV program in See It Now, where he exposed McCarthy, if you will, was in March 1954. So four years earlier, uh, the Alsops had been critical of McCarthy. And another uh, pet, pro pet, or, you know, uh, 
not pet project, but big issue for uh, uh, Joe Alsop, and uh, sort of became a Bolero-like theme in his uh, in his column, was the missile gap with the Soviet Union. That he, uh, in a number of columns in uh, 1957 under the Eisenhower administration, he warned, actually 56 to 57, he warned that the Soviet Union already had an advantage in the technology of intercontinental ballistic missiles, and that this uh, advantage was going to grow, that in fact the Soviets already were at a 10 to 1 advantage over the U.S. Which is curious, and he and Joe not only wrote these columns, but he had them independently, uh, he paid to have them bound together, and he gave them to members of Congress who were sympathetic. But it turns out that um, he should have known better, because one of the people who was uh, a frequent guest at his dinner table was Richard Bissell, who succeeded Frank Wisner as head of the plans director at the CIA, and who oversaw the overhead reconnaissance program at the CIA, uh, involving the U-2 and later the Corona reconnaissance satellite. So. Bissell was in a good position to know that the missile gap didn't exist, um, or at least there was no evidence of a gap that favored the, the Soviet Union. And in fact, we later found out that uh, once we had the, the satellite, that uh, th there was a gap, and indeed it was it went the other way around. It was a ten to one advantage of the United States. So what? So the, there has always been a question as to why, in my my mind, in my research, why did Joe Alsop? think that there was a missile gap that favored the Soviet Union when he had Dick Bissell, head of the overhead reconnaissance program with the U-2, there at the dinner table to tell him otherwise. And I think the answer may be that uh, the missile gap became a very potent political campaign issue for John Kennedy in the 1960 campaign against Richard Nixon. And as Joe Alsop uh, said, uh, confided to someone, he would do almost anything to see John Kennedy elected president. Well, uh, Joe Alsop married Susan Mary uh, Patton. Uh, Susan, uh, Bill Patton died of, he had chronic emphysema. He died in 1960. Joe and Susan Mary were married in uh, 1961. Uh, Joe was gay. So the question is, uh, why, why the marriage? And um, Bill Patton, Jr., believes that, and has written in his own book, that he believes it was because uh, Joe Alsop needed cover, in effect. He was now a Kennedy insider. Uh, he was under scrutiny uh, in, in, by other journalists, um, uh, and that he, uh, he needed, in fact, to, uh, to show that he was now a family man. And the reason is, is the following. This is really the only document uh, that shows evidence of what, has, what I've called the Moscow incident. That in 1950, February 1957, uh, Joe Alsop went to, he'd always wanted to report on Moscow from Moscow, to be in the belly of the beast, as he called it. So he went to Moscow, and uh, he was basically ensnared in a uh, homosexual honey trap while he was there. That there was a KGB agent by the name of Boris, who um, Alsop will describe as athletic, youngish, and blonde who engaged Alsop in a conversation at dinner, and, uh, and they spoke French. And at the end of the conversation, Boris invited Alsop to visit him in his hotel room uh, the next day. Well, the next day, after what the Russians would call the act, two uh, KGB agents burst into the room and uh, confront Alsop with photographs of he and Boris, naked, and uh, tell Alsop that he has now, he had better cooperate for the sake of peace, that Alsop would later say, confide to someone, that he thought that the only way out of this was suicide. But he thought, but then later he changed his mind and he said that he was going to uh, play this out to see where the game would lead. So he contacted his friend, Chip Bolin, who was then at that time the American ambassador uh, to Moscow, and let him know sort of cryptically that something had happened uh, and, and the nature of it. And uh, Boland then contacted his friend, and Joe's friend as well, Frank Wisner, who was head of the plans director at CIA, and said, um, but what should we do? And Wisner uh, went back to, to Boland and said, Joe has to write an account of what happened. He has to give it to you. You have to give it to me. I will give it to Ellen Dulles, another friend and neighbor actually in, Ge in Georgetown, uh, and who was Ellen Dulles, who was head of, uh, head of the CIA, director of the CIA. And Dulles will give it to Hoover. And once the KG, or once the CIA and, and the FBI know about this, that will pull the sting from the KGB blackmail threat. 
And that is, uh, that's what happened. And this is basically the telegram that Boland, uh, Joe, after the incident, had gone on to Leningrad. And this is the telegram that Boland sends to Alsop and Leningrad saying, come back and when, come back to Moscow. And when he came back to Moscow, he wrote what uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Alan Dulles would call a confession, uh, eight and a half single-spaced pages of uh, exactly what had happened in Moscow, and, and it would be in some detail. Uh, and this is the, uh, a document I got from the CIA from the Freedom of, through the Freedom of Information Act uh, that basically Alan Dulles classified Joe's confession as top secret, eyes only. He did send it to, uh, uh, to Hoover, uh, and uh, it was also sent to Eisenhower, and Actually, Eisenhower, to his credit, even though Joe was very critical of Eisenhower, especially over the missile gap issue, um, that Eisenhower, to his credit, uh, told his subordinate that this, this should be kept in a, in a special safe and only released to anybody uh, with his, his, the president, President Eisenhower's personal permission. J. Edgar Hoover was less careful about it. J. Edgar Hoover began telling uh, others in Washington about it, and uh, in fact, he would brief, he briefed President Kennedy on it uh, the very first day uh, that Kennedy was, uh, was in office, and he also briefed uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy on Joe's, uh, Joe's affair. And Hoover was very disappointed, he told an aide, when it turned out that uh, they did not seem to be too impressed with this. Well, it remains a secret, uh, Joe's affair does, for, um, for some time. Actually, it, it remains a uh, secret from the public until after Joe's death, five years after his death. He dies in 1989. Uh, but uh, higher circles in Washington certainly knew. J. Edgar Hoover made sure that they knew that Joe had been involved uh, in this affair, and yet it didn't seem to affect Joe's reporting. Joe continued to be anti-Hoover, anti-FBI, and anti, um, uh, actually anti-Eisenhower for, uh, for the most part, and certainly, more than anything, anti-Soviet. But in 1970, uh, the pictures that had been taken back in 1957 start showing up in the mailboxes of Joe's enemies in Washington, and not only his enemies, but actually some of his friends. And, uh, and it was include, included with the pictures was this, um, was this letter. Uh, the pictures were sent from, uh, it was unsigned, and the pictures were sent from Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, they was, again, were sent to uh, his, his enemies, but also Art Buckwald, who was not really an enemy, but not really a friend. Art Buckwald had just done a play in 1970 about Joe Alsop called Sheep on the Runway. Uh, it was a satire. Uh, it's about a, a very influential American political columnist by the name of Joe Mayflower. Uh, but obviously, Joe Alsop was the target of this. Joe hated the play. He forbade his friends from going to it. They went in disguise anyway. But uh, so, so whoever sent this probably perceived Art Buckwald as being an enemy. Art Buckwald didn't know what to do about the pictures. Uh, he said he was. He told. Uh, uh, confident that he was, uh, he was not used to receiving uh, naked pictures in the mail. So he went to, but he knew Phil Jalen, who was the uh, editor of the editorial page of the Washington Post, was a friend of Joe Alsop's. So Buckwald went to uh, Jalen, and um, together they discussed what should be done. Eventually, uh, Richard Helms, who was director of the CIA, was called in, and uh, Richard Helms went over, went to the KGB, uh, either directly or through an, an, an agent of his, a CIA agent, and uh, basically told the KGB to knock it off. Uh, that, that otherwise the CIA would expose KGB agents for, uh, uh, for their behavior. But this was the letter that was included with the photographs, and actually this was not in the Library of Congress papers of Joe Alsop. This was uh, given to me by, uh, by the family um, who, who wanted the story to, uh, to be told. I think actually this, there's, I won't get into this in detail, but there's a lot of speculation as to who sent the photographs. If you saw the play, the columnist that had John Lithgow playing the part of Joe Alsop, you know that J. Edgar Hoover was one of the suspects. Um, David Halberstam was, uh, was mentioned. Uh, David Halberstam would have had reason just because Joe tried to get him fired from the New York Times because of his coverage of Vietnam, but Halberstam certainly didn't, wouldn't have done it, didn't have access to the photos. But I think it was this man, Anatoly Dobrynin, who was the uh, Soviet ambassador to the U.S. and who was attacked personally in a column that Joe wrote uh, somewhat before the pictures were sent. 
saying that Dobrynin was a liar. It was a, an art, it was a column critical of Soviet policy in the Middle East, saying Dobrynin was a liar and that he should be uh, thrown out of the country, declared persona non grata and recalled to Moscow. And Dobrynin, we kn I know, knew about the Moscow incident because there's a conversation he had with Henry Kissinger that is taped where they both referred to it. So Dobrynin is my suspect in the book for uh, who sent the pictures. Well, Joe would later say uh, near the end of his life that his, uh, his, his health and his reputation and his career basically were ruined by Vietnam. He was an, an early hawk on Vietnam. Uh, he and Stewart wrote a column um, in 1953 called Where is Dien Bien Phu, predicting the fall of the French fortress and arguing that America was going to be in, in, drawn into the conflict in Vietnam and Southeast Asia unless, um, unless the Eisenhower administration aided the French. Um, so he, he was a hawk very early on and remained one until the very end and beyond. Um, he was still a hawk at the time of the Tet Offensive in 1968, and after that Tet Offensive, American opinion polls by a majority uh, wanted the United States out of Vietnam. Joe continued to argue if we would stay the course, if we would continue to send troops and treasure, that we could win the war, and that if we ever, if we did lose the war, America would lose its preeminent position in the world and vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets. So he, I think uh, Joe was anomalous, really, Ameri among American reporters in not only the degree of his support for the war, but the duration of it, uh, that he continued to, uh, to be a hawk. Um, oh, this is, this is a picture from uh, the play, uh, Sheep on the Runway. Um, just, uh, I guess, you know, I'll just give you the plot summary that basically Joe Mayflower, the, Ameri the, the columnist, goes to a mythical kingdom in the Himalayas where there's an insurgency from the north that uh, Joe, by his reporting, gets the Pentagon to, uh, to bomb the, uh, the north, but actually they, they mistake uh, and hit the palace instead. And so the warlord actually from the north actually comes to power, but it, everything works out okay because the warlord is actually working for the CIA. So Joe hated the uh, display and, again, forbade people to go to it. He threatened to, to sue Art Buckwald, but uh, uh, he, he didn't follow through on the threat. Actually, the play probably would have uh, closed quickly, except that Joe let it be known to the, co the gossip columnist of the Post that he hated the play and that he wanted it to close. And, he, uh, and Kay Graham and Ben Bradley even went to Buckwald and tried to get Buckwald to do something about, you know, to change the name of the character, if nothing else. Um, but Buckwald said, no, it's really a play about uh, Joseph Kraft, who was, who, was, who was the liberal columnist for the New York Times. Plainly not. Well, there would be two plays on Joe Alsop. This is the one that opened in April 2012, and it had uh, John Lithgow playing the part of Joe. And uh, Whereas the, the, form of the 1970 play was a satire uh, and, and was humorous, at least in its intent, uh, I think the, the play, The Columnist, with uh, Alsop playing the, uh, with uh, Lithgow playing the part of Alsop, is really a, a tragedy uh, because it, uh, Joe increasingly is out of step with uh, the country that he'd reported on. His column began on the last day of 1945. It would, he would give it up uh, at the end of 1974, one reason being that uh, his popularity, the popularity of the column, uh, had dropped precipitously. Uh, he had gone from 200 papers down to 50, and he was, he was read less and less. He was viewed, as he admitted himself, as a kind of curmudgeon. Uh, he missed uh, issues like uh, the women's liberation movement. He didn't uh, write about that. Uh, race relations. Uh, he was a one-note Johnny, basically, on Vietnam for all these years, so he lost his readership. So at the end of the play, I think rather, rather sadly that uh, John Lithgow, as, as Alsop, is uh, seated at, at his Underwood typewriter. Uh, he's past deadline, uh, can't think of anything to write, and, uh, and uh, the curtain comes down. The lights go off, the curtain comes down. This actually is the, uh, was the opening scene in The Columnist. of uh, the, uh, the playwright, name I forget right now, uh, didn't know about the Alsop's confession, so he, he had the name wrong. He calls the spy Andre, but we know from Joe's own account that his name was Boris. 
This is sort of a classic picture of Joe near uh, late in his life. He decided after he gave up his column in 1974. He said he would never write about politics again. It's not really quite true, but his but he did write a book, and his major his major book, as he called it, was on collecting rare art, since he was quite an art collector himself of Chinese art and, and Chinese ceramics. Well, I, I want to. This is. I'm going to make this a bit of a multimedia production, if I can. Uh, I've talked about uh, Joe Alsop, but um, I think you should be able to uh, to hear him. And uh, Joe had a peculiar diction that he was uh, described variously as grot and lockjaw, and uh, for the. Uh, well, okay, well, actually, I'll uh, before we started here, um, a little uh, setting here. This, this is a uh, telephone conversation between Joe Alsop and Lyndon Johnson. The date is November 25, 1963, three days after the assassination of President Kennedy. Alsop is concerned that uh, Johnson is going to give the investigation of Kennedy's assassination over to the FBI, and he doesn't trust the FBI. And so he basically calls up Johnson and says, I want you to appoint a blue ribbon commission that will investigate the president and not have Hoover or Robert Kennedy investigate it. Hoover because Joe didn't trust Hoover. Robert Kennedy because he didn't want Robert Kennedy investigating the death, the murder of his own brother. And Robert Kennedy was, of course, a close friend of Joe's as well. So this, I'm just, it's a 15-minute conversation. I'm going to play one minute of it. Uh, this is sort of midstream, but it's where Joe is telling uh, LBJ uh, why he should appoint this Blue Ribbon Commission that becomes, in effect, the Warren Commission. And uh, it is classic uh, Joe Alsop, as I think you'll hear. Uh, hopefully, you'll hear. I agree with that, but in this case, it does have to be the killing of the president. Right. And, the, and the, the thing is, I'm not suggesting. I'm, I'm, but mind you, mind you, Mr. President, I'm not talking about an investigative body. I am talking about a body which will take the all the evidence that the FBI has amassed when they have completed their inquiry and produced a public report on the death of the president. That, I think, you see, that is not an interference in Texas. That is, a, wait a second now, that is a way to transmit to the public without breach of confidence and in a way that will carry absolute conviction what the FBI has turned up. Why can't, why can't the FBI transmit it? Because no one, uh, again, on the left, they won't believe the FBI. Oh, oh, dang it. It cut out the best part. Because uh, he says at the end, and the FBI doesn't write very well. So, Joe, Joe Alsop. I, I was trying to think of the, what the, uh, the other description of Joe's diction was, and it was um, Charles Lawton playing Oscar Wilde. <laughs> but one of Joe's relatives, uh, the Alsop family was nice enough to invite me to the party they had after the opening of The Columnist, and one of uh, actually Teeny Zimmerman's son said, uh, you know, there was nothing really exotic about it. It was Connecticut. In regard to the missile gap, uh, it uh, was not introduced in the campaign by Kennedy, but earlier in the Senate and in his own campaign by uh, Stuart Symington, mm -hmm. who had been Secretary of the Air Force. And you wonder where did the question of the missile gap come up, and I think you can look to the Air Force. In fact, by that time, because U-2 had begun flying in 56, the U.S. government, in the form of the uh, Defense Department and CIA and the President and Vice President, knew that there was no missile gap. Because they knew it through that information, they could not counter first Symington and then Kennedy and Kennedy rode that subject very heavily in his campaign. Yeah. Now, Stuart Symington was actually one of Kennedy, uh, one of jo Joe Alsop's major sources. And Symington had someone on his staff, uh, if I 
pronounce the name right, Thomas uh, Lanier, who uh, had worked uh, for the contractor that was building the Atlas missile. And, uh, and basically, you're, you're, I agree with you, you're right, that uh, this was a conflict of interest, really, in terms of reporting. But it was typical of Joe's own approach that his was not investigative journalism as we understand it today. It was elite or access journalism. And he would report on, he would go to the people uh, for information on the people he was reporting on. So uh, it obviously limited, him. that's why he missed Watergate, uh, that he, he went, his sources for Watergate were Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. And strangely enough, they didn't really tell him what was going on. So he, he, um, he, he missed Watergate and he kept on telling Kay Graham that, um, that the Washington Post was following that story down, to a, uh, down a dead end road. And he, even a year after the break in and the coverage of Watergate by Wood, Woodward and Bernstein, he was still saying that uh, there's nothing there, it's a third rate burglary. He would later admit that he was wrong and, and write a personal letter to Kay Graham apologizing for his blindness and, and praising Woodward and Bernstein, but this is after he had just about the time he'd retired. Um, but you're right, you know, the, uh, the missile gap wasn't, I don't, they didn't know definitively exactly how many missiles there were until the Corona satellite uh, the, uh, that he reported, you know, the film was returned from the satellite, and it turned out that uh, there were four missiles at Plisetsk, and that was the, the extent of it. Khrushchev had said that uh, uh, the, you know, the Soviet Union is, is turning out missiles like sausages. And, uh, and his, his son, Sergei, said later, later that his father was telling the truth, that uh, they weren't making sausages either. <laughs> One of the questions I, I've been asked um, recently is basically what is the difference between uh, Washington then and Washington now, at least in, in terms of politics. and. The major difference, uh, I think, is the fact that people back then did, t even on opposite ends of the political spectrum, did talk to one another and actually even partied together. That uh, I mentioned the uh, the dinners, the Sunday night suppers were typically raucous. They uh, they were independent of political affiliation. That. Uh, uh, it was said that uh, the devil himself would be invited to dinner at Joe Alsop's house as long as he kept his tail hidden under the table and wore patent leather shoes. Uh, Joe said that it was never an, considered an argument in the Alsop household until somebody had gotten up and walked out of the dining room at least twice. So, uh, and, and he admitted this was probably not a good um, uh, this was unfortunate, at least, you know, he, he offended people like Walter Lippmann because Lippmann would have so soirees or, or salons as well, and they were very decorous. But uh, it was very, what Lippmann did, his, his parties, his salons were entirely in contrast to what uh, Joe Alsop had. And I think, frankly, Joe Alsop's would have been more fun. Why was he so accepted? I, I you know, we listen to this now, he sounds like a bore. Um, he, <laughs> well, he became he, a bore later on yeah, Vietnam, well, actually. He, he had many attributes that in, people would have usually stayed away from him. Why was he protected and so many others were not protected? Why was he encouraged and so many others were not encouraged? Well, uh, protected from, you mean the fact, his homosexuality? His homosexuality. Well, yeah, you know, it, it's one of these things that actually, uh, it was a secret, but it wasn't a secret. No, it wasn't. Yeah, well, uh, well, it was a secret from the public, and uh, and basically Joe wanted to make sure that it continued that way because, given the temper of the times, it, back in the '60s, even as late as the '70s, uh, early '70s, I think it, he feared it would be career-ending. So, um, and it, it wasn't kept secret in that, in that every president who came along was briefed by Hoover on what had happened. But but Joe can but Joe continued you know he he didn't pull his punches even though he knew that secret was out there and to me that that is that shows a certain amount of courage. I don't know if that's uh, was why was he listened to ultimately he wasn't because but, but why he. Why in the beginning did they protect him so much? If everyone who, knew, but why was he protected and so many other people were not? I am. Um, uh, you know, Ben Bradley certainly certainly knew. Everybody knew, but uh, nobody said it was "don't ask, don't tell" sort of uh, sort of thing. Um, it's Hoover tried to do him in as as best he could, but he he um, 
Yeah, well, I, I, if, if, uh, if that happened, I didn't find it. <laughs> um, my question has to do with, you alluded to the, to the devil earlier uh, being welcome to the dinner parties. Were there people who were outcasts uh, from the Georgetown set, or were there people that were excluded, or mm -hmm. um, was it, you know, was it wide open? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a good good point. Uh, there were people who were and in, not invited back certainly, uh, and who were uh, crossed off the list. But um, and the one I can think of is Gordon Gray, and Gordon Gray had been Secretary of the Army under Truman, and if the name is familiar, he was the fellow who chaired the Atomic Energy Commission hearing into the loyalty of Robert Oppenheimer, and if you remember that the the hearing came to the conclusion that. Uh, Oppenheimer was not a traitor, but that his judgment could not be trusted because of previous actions and therefore his clearance should be lifted. And um, Gordon Gray basically wrote the, the majority report for that, and, and that was the summary. And Robert Oppenheimer was a good personal friend and source for Joe uh, Alsop. So, um, even though Gordon Gray was part of the WASP ascendancy and had been a friend of, uh, of Joe Alsop, that Joe wrote him a note saying that everything you have done in your career that has been uh, good up to this point has been completely undone by your act of cowardice regarding uh, Robert Oppenheimer. And uh, Gordon Gray did not, was not invited back. Uh, well, actually, I take it back. He was invited back several years later. Uh, Boyden Gray, Gordon's son, tried to sort of patch things over between Joe and, um, uh, and his father. Um, but they never really quite succeeded. I think Joe, a number of years after he wrote that note, issued a dinner invitation to Gordon and it was, uh, there was no response. The, uh, Boyden Gray, I interviewed Boyden Gray and he, uh, he described uh, the occasion where Joe came to his father and tried to, uh, this is before the Oppenheimer case, and tried to recruit his father when he was Secretary of the Army under Truman to, uh, to be a source, a confidential source. And uh, Joe, and sort of Boyden can't say, Joe came there and said, uh, well, uh, you know, Gordon, uh, Gordon, I think that you should be able to uh, help us, you know, here, that you should be a confidential source for me, that we can help each other, and uh, a hum, a hum, a hum, and uh, old school tie, and a hum, a hum, a hum. And, uh, and Gordon Gray just broke it off and said, uh, Joe, I didn't go to Groton. And uh, he was not gonna be, he was not gonna be a source. There were some people who did that, who refused to cooperate uh, notably with, uh, with Alsop, who were in positions of high power, including Eisenhower's national security advisor, uh, Robert Cutler. Uh, but uh, it could be dangerous to get on, on uh, Alsop's bad side uh, because um, Alsop wrote a, when Cutler resigned from his, for reasons of health, and stepped down, that Alsop dedicated a column, column to him uh, called Secrecy Versus Freedom. And uh, it was basically an attack upon Cutler. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.